like, at, you know, you know the guy who says when he walks in and his boss tells him what to do and he says, I can bench 350 pounds. I bench more than you. I bench so more I than you so I don't have to listen to what you say. That's literally what I feel. I, I, literally, I literally, that's the manifestation of my own life. Yeah, you know, they feel like that on the plant floor too, but it's called forklift certified. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. true. Oh, I didn't see you there. We're at Tulip today. So this is brand new here. Like uh, you've been here, but you guys renovated. Body. Body. Yeah, so this, this building has an interesting history actually. So this building was originally the Ford assembly plant. Right. That's why this whole area is called assembly row. We've got the picture of the Ford Etzel here. So this here used to be the old value stream for the Ford Etzel back in the day. Got and it. then it went through cheap kind of retail. It was a Kmart for a long time. And then we came in and you know, we're bringing manufacturing back to Boston. It's kind of the way we think about Got it. it. We've been in this space for just over a year. So we yeah. did our open house about a year ago. Before this, we were in a little space over in Somerville, fourth floor of the chocolate factory. Okay. Yeah. So who, who, are, the, who's the found, who are the founders of Tulip? Yeah, Natan and Ronnie. So uh, CEO, CTO. Okay. Natan, Natan's on the road today. Ronnie might be in today. Um, okay. Yeah. And their vision was what? As you see it. Yeah, yeah. As a, what was their, you know, hey, to give manufacturing a modern set of tools. Okay. You know, to the people who are doing the work every day, the people who know the operation the best, to give them modern technology to help them do their work better. So was that from like a CICD perspective, hey, there needs to be a toolkit for people on the yeah. front line to be able to solve their own problems? Yeah, basically. The, I mean, okay. we, so we came out of the Fluid Interfaces lab okay. at MIT. Uh, the idea here, so founders both have a background in manufacturing and in technology, right? Yeah. And so Fluid Interfaces lab was focused on you know, how do you remove the barrier between technology and the humans that interact with that technology, right? So that was really the core of this. And the insight was, you know, both new manufacturing, you know, I grew up in Grand Rapids, you know, and my yep. family's all in manufacturing. So you look at the tools that are available to, you know, B2C, the stuff on your phone, yep. uh, B2B enterprise SaaS for knowledge workers, and you've got a whole stack of tools that you can use, you know, whether you're doing designing, whether you're doing engineering, whether you're doing CRM, whatever the case may be, ERPs, all this stuff. When you get out into the people who actually do the work, the frontline operations workforce, yep. there's nothing there. You see pen and paper, you see sticks and bricks, you see old monolithic backend architectures from the 80s and 90s. And why do you think that is? Why is that the case? Yeah, why do you think that is? Well, we can talk about it. I've got yeah. a, a you know a longer discussion on this, and we, we okay. can sit down, I've got a little presentation prepared for you as well. Cool. But the gist of it is like the, the way that these types of systems have been architected from day one, on premise, you define the processes, you define the requirements, you submit a, vent, a vendor, then they go, they build out the back-end architecture, they say, okay, this is gonna deploy on-prem, here are all the data models that you need, here are all the interactions you're gonna have, we're gonna lock this down, nobody's ever gonna touch it again, and if you do, you need to call us. Right. Then, we're gonna slap a front end on it, that's always the last thing to come. 18 yeah. months later, you're gonna actually roll this out on the shop floor, and then you're on the operations side, and you're like, what the hell is this? Right. You know, this is like, First of all, the people who defined the requirements a year and a half ago didn't actually know the operation. That's right. And, Second and of all, they and they didn't know what you would ultimately want. Eventually. Precisely. Right. And the operation changed. That was right. a year and a half ago, That's man. Right. Product yeah. line A sold, product line B didn't, right? right? So the idea here is that these are dynamic environments and you need tools that you can evolve, that you can change, that you can adjust to accommodate the needs you have, the needs that you have today. So that was the gist of the whole no code platform that, you know, that is Tulip today. And but Tulip is more than no code. Right, like you, you go to market no code, yep. right? Because that's probably the best way to land. But it's a lot more than just no code. Well, it's, right? it's, it's, you know, I'm a little kitschy here, but it's all no code. So you can do everything yeah. no code, right? But it's also low code, right? right so right. The, the idea here in our first product principle is we want to build Tulip with low barriers, but high ceilings. The point is, if you're, if you're a production engineer, you're on the line, you know your job better than anybody else in the world, but you don't know how to develop software, we want this tool to be accessible to you. So we modeled the no-code experience after, you know, basically Google Slides or, you know, PowerPoint right. plus Excel plus simple workflow, if then else, logic, yeah. right? Yeah. If you understand that stuff, you can apply these tools to solve the problems that you know better than anybody else on the shop floor. Now that said, IT does get involved. So do people, in, increasingly, I think, the, what, who we're seeing enter the workforce is people, who, they're engineers. Right. They grew up, you know, they, they grew up on this stuff. They're right. comfortable slinging a little bit of code. They can write some Python scripts. Right. So the idea is we want to make it accessible to your, you know, your average frontline engineer, 
But if you do have some software chops or you are trying to integrate this into your existing digital infrastructure, which by the way, like 99% of our customers do, yep. you can take it that extra mile, right? Yeah, perfect. Is two things. One, it's a demo space where we give demos of the product. More importantly than that though, it's a lab for us. So we hire a, a lot of our sales team, a lot of our services team, they come from manufacturing, they've got deep domain expertise, but a lot of our engineers don't know the first thing about me. When you say manufacturing, you're saying they are, they, they have frontline experience as well? Yeah, so well, like tip, yeah, tip, it, it, it depends, right? So it depends on who we're hiring. If we're hiring more on the sales side, they typically didn't come from the operations, they come from you know, Camstar or but something But you do like have op people who have operational experience. Yes, absolutely. Okay, got it. Particularly right. on our services side, our okay. support side. So that's rare. It's critical. It's, it's, it's really, critical. It's and it's really also part rare. of the reason why, like a lot of people trying to serve this injury fall, fall flat. Right, they, they don't. They, they don't understand the problem. Right. They're bringing software developer or you know computer scientists straight out of school. Right. No operational experience right. whatsoever. They're brilliant. Yep. They can cr they can build products but they don't understand what the actual problem is. What we yeah. talk about all the time is the problem, if you want to know what the problem is in an organization, in any manufacturer, yeah. you go to the front line. Yes, sir. They know what all the problems are. Yes, sir. They literally can list them off. <laughs> they may not say them the way we're going to say them, yeah. right? They may drop F-bombs and they may get mad at you because yeah. they've been trying to fix this for 12 years. We drop F-bombs around here, right. don't <laughs> right. worry. But you go to the front line. Yeah, so exactly. One of the first things I ask every vendor when I go is to tell me about, like, the, how do you leverage people who have operational experience yeah. in your organization. Are you running, are you, do, you, do you bring somebody who's actually run a piece of equipment, put them inside that yellow box, and tell them and have them give you feedback Precisely. on how this workflow is going to, at the end of the day, get us closer to theoretical output yeah. on, that, on that line, right? Well, and that's, that's also why it's critical, uh, you know, not, th that's also why it's critical, like, so we need that to be able to inform our approach, our strategy, like right. how we tell, how to help our customers adopt Tulip. But also it's important to note, we don't have a delivery organization. Right. You can't contract us and say like, build a solution and then like, you know, right. we won't do business with you if that's what you're asking for. Right. What we have is an adoption management office. What we come in, we, we come in, we'll help you understand, we'll understand the problems, talk to the front line, and then say, great, here's how we're gonna, here's best practices, but here's how you build it. And if we haven't transferred responsibility of that, of that solution right. over to the customer, then we failed. Yeah, we say, in, in fact, in all of our organizations, our partner integrators, you know, 4.0 solutions, we just do architecture yeah. and education, right? But we also do digital transformation maturity assessment, which is the starting point yeah, for yeah. these organizations. One of the things we're asking the organizations during that engagement is, are you expecting a vendor to come in yeah. and own this and then support it forever? Or is your mindset, no, what I want is a partner to get me started. Yeah. You know, the, the force multiplication in the beginning, get us onboarded, yeah. and then eventually we take ownership, and then all they have them as is a, a resource for architecture, Precisely. Co complex questions. So there's it's, an onboarding process. It's the only way to do business. Right, it's right the only way you can do and it. And let me show yeah. you something, actually. So, and the other part of this is, so why did we build Tulip the way that we did, and how are we intending people to engage with this? Okay. You know, we're going to get into this a little bit deeper a little bit later, yeah. but what I want to show you is, look, this is the admin side of Tulip, where the engineers go to build applications, deploy these to the shop floor, to connect it to third-party systems, build out analyses. Everything you see on every screen here is just a Tulip app, okay? Yep. This is how you build all this stuff. But the point is, and then at the end of the day, it's going to live on some interface. Maybe it's a cell phone, maybe it's a touch screen, maybe it's a tablet, maybe it's a, a wearable. I mean, mm -hmm. not many people use them to right. be honest, but you know. If Honestly, you, they should have. But if, if they Google, talk, Google Glass was our favorite, we've got them, our favorite originally. We've got them right over there. And then and when they abandoned the project, we were I like, know. what? You gotta be kidding me. The point is, if it talks to the internet, you can put an app on it, right? And that's just a function of our modern architecture, right? But the point here is, you put this on the shop floor and you say, okay, Mr. Operator, Mr. Associate, how does this look? And they say, that looks pretty good, but, and there's always a but, yeah. And, and at first, there's, before you say, how does this look, there's a big eye roll, like, oh boy, here yeah. we go again, right? Flavor of the month. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we say, here you go. So they'll say something like, oh, you know what, this is pretty good, but, and this is another reason, why is no code so important? Because you can sit on the shop floor and say, what are you missing? You know, you can do things like, oh, you know what, I actually need a button here, and what's this button going to do? Let me show you. You know, I want to add logic to it, but the whole point is, this is all drag and drop, and it's drag and drop because this work shouldn't take place in some office somewhere. Right, this work should take place in Gemba, where right, the work is actually taking place. Immediate feedback, right? Precisely. Immediate feedback. The, and uh, iterate, and this is where the right. operator is like, oh, you're actually listening to what I say. Right. You actually like, care about what I think, right? And if you start, and that's when their eyes light up and they say, okay, this is a tool for me and I can actually use this, right? So button is a component. I know we're going to talk about this more later, yeah. but I just, button is a component. 
Tulip has an SDK so that I can build components? Yeah. Okay, got it, yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah. Which is an important, that's the high ceiling. That's piece. the high right. ceiling right. piece, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I'll give you which, any. Which, by the way, I, did, I knew the answer, but I want to make sure I asked the well, questions. Well, you're, you're, you yeah. know, not everybody does. So yeah, I want to make sure to I ask the about. questions. Uh, all right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and. And when you say app, you're meaning, when you say application, you're meaning project in other, so like in Ignition, for example, yeah. project equals app in Tulip. So, right. Sort of. The for app for us is, one, we use the language because everybody knows what it means. That's right. how we interact with things. Like The frame of reference here is I got my cell phone and I need to do my banking here. I have a specific place I go to manage that. I want to call a taxi. I have a specific place I go to manage so that. I want to do functional. messaging. Yeah, so it's very functionally aligned. But really what app is, is it's a way to take this very complex system and then modularize that complexity, assign that, that piece of the system to people who have domain expertise on that part, and enable decentralized but parallelized process improvement. Got it. So these applications can be distributed. But sharing common but resources on the, bottom, on the back end. And then they Got can it. connect, and you can share information. Right. An example of which is like, I'm here doing an assembly, I'm running low on inventory, let me send a notification. This is an app that's solving a specific problem, but that data, that signal, has a whole other network of apps that's going to depend on that signal to do things like inventory replenishment, to do things like Andon, to do things like, you know, this list of open work orders is being populated by the back end ERP, right? In this Got case, it. we're talking to SAP. Got so it. the point is, it's an app. It solves a specific problem, and it has physical context, right? Yep. This, you know, it talks to. How does how does Tulip talk to SAP? What's the form? Uh, HTTP connector. We okay, just, got yeah. it, through the HTTP connector. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all right. Which we can get into in detail. Perfect. We're awesome. going to spend some time in here. Um, the custom widgets, I'll just give you a quick example. This is a classic example. Like, this is not a widget that we're going to make universally available for everybody right. because we think that so many people have this specific cart with this specific. You know, this is an example of something you can code up in, if you're good, 20 minutes. You just put your own JSON, your CSS, your HTML and then you deploy it, and then it's available as a click, drag, and drop function, right? Got it. And, and that's kind of foundational to our product and button is a function. A button is literally a thing you just drag and put there and you can click. So is a bin, if I create a bin object or a bin resource, yep. is, is that the equivalent of a prepackaged button object or resource in Tulip? Yeah, yeah. If they're, they're treated the same way? Yes. Okay, got it. For, all, for all intents and purposes. The difference is with a button, you would configure the logic using no code. Here, you've hardwired that logic by writing the JavaScript. Got it. So it's, so it's JS. So it's JS. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. got it. All right, good. Functionally the same. The way you configure it's a little different. All right, perfect. All right. All right, let's, I want to give you guys a tour of the space. We're going to come back in here, spend a lot of time going much deeper into this stuff. Um, this, so is, this is cool. This is kind of cool. This, let's go in here for a sec. So is this one app spread across four screens or four? Nope. This is just a, you know, we put it in an app, but then there was really no reason for it to be an app. This is just a little web service that we put together. Okay. You know, Tulip's a cloud native platform. So you can see like, real time, this shows you every, so every blue dot here is a human being right now that's using an application to do their job. Like right now, this second, right? Okay. Every yellow dot is an event that's been received by Tulip. So this is a part was produced. A quality defect was captured, a machine state changed, something like that, right? So you can see, you know, Europe is still working, the West Coast is starting to wake up, East Coast is working. If you're in here late at night, you see Europe's asleep, you see the US going to sleep, you see APAC light up. So, you know what's really funny? Here's another thing. I am absolutely stunned at how many people did not know Tulip is here. Yeah. Well, we piggybacked on this live work thing yeah. a little bit. It is. It really blows my mind. I, I talked to so many people yesterday. Yeah. And I said, hey, I'm gonna go visit Tulip tomorrow. And they go, oh, Tulip's in Boston? Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah. Well, I, what I said from the very beginning was, listen, Tulip's going places. Then, a, then let's say a year passes, and then, every, and then I actually did a video just a couple months ago saying, you know, inductive automation needs to worry about Tulip. You know, if, if it, inductive automation doesn't mean we're worried about frameworks. They don't need to be worried about Factory Studio because Factory Studio is more High, super high speed applications. Mm -hmm. When your visualization needs to update at the same rate your process updates, now you need frameworks because yeah. it's much closer to the motherboard. Sure. Inductive automation needs to worry about Tulip now. And that's my position. That's part of the reason I want to be here yeah. is, you know, there's there are some serious advantages your platform has over Ignition, not the least of which is Ignition is on a dated code base, yeah. a really dated code base. And there are real questions now about what's the long-term viability of a platform built in Java yeah. and using Jython 2.5, which is, I mean, by the way, we're at the 
we're, we're, we're really close to Python 4, and they're still on Python 2. So mm -hmm. the question is, what is going to happen? You know, if, if, what's, what is, the, what is the, the long term viability of that platform? And so what we've been looking for is, how, what do we tell our audience? Okay, here are the solutions you should be choosing from. Like the most thing, the most important thing is your digital strategy and your architecture. And then you piece in the solutions to into that architecture. Yep. Start there. The big conversation that we're having with people now as it relates to Tulip is, hey, listen, short time to value is very important. Yep. Right? Being able to provoke you have to be able to do in six to ten weeks, you have to be able to spend fifty thousand dollars or less and yield a quarter million dollars return in six to ten weeks. So there aren't many platforms that fit that requirement. If you you got to be able to onboard and in six to 10 weeks, yep. spend less than $50,000 in engineering and licensing and yield a $250,000 return within the next 12 months. Yep. There aren't many platforms. Tulip is one of those. Yeah. It's a small, you betcha. small suite of, of products out there. I, I started to tell you, we do demos here, things like that. More importantly, it's a, it's a lab, right? So our engineers who don't come from industry they, every time they need to go to the bathroom, when they come in in the morning, when they go home at night, they walk through this space. And what we have here are representative use cases that you see across the whole of our customer base, which means, and this is on an alpha release. So anything that they ship lands here first before any customer ever sees it. So if I'm an engineer, I just committed code. I can walk up to a station, like what a customer is gonna be interacting with, and I can see the code that I just committed, and I can see how it, you know, how it looks, how it feels, how it impacts uh, the overall usability of the platform. And right, and Tulip is fully cloud. Yeah. No on-prem. Uh, fully cloud, no on-prem. We do have an edge an edge presence. Got it. So we've got our edge hardware. At, uh, we also have an on-prem connector host that we'll use to interface with other on-prem systems. And how many connectors, how many different connectors do you have? I couldn't tell you. Oh, like, it's a lot. A lot. Okay. <laughs> like a, many. So you, you would feel comfortable in saying that you have a industrial business connector suite? Yes, okay. for sure, absolutely. Right. It's, it's pretty wild. We moved into this place just like a year and a half ago, and we're like, you know, we're never going to use all this space. Now we do an all hands. And we ran out of them. It's standing space, right? room only. There's yeah. not enough chairs. It's, it's pretty wild. It's amazing how you grow into the space that you have. This we're is big, Atlas. We're big dog people. Atlas he's is my favorite of the office <laughs> dogs. So. He's two yeah. employee number what? Seven, seven yeah. ten. Yeah. Very nice. Hey, so what you're telling me is there's more than one office dog? Yeah, there is yeah, more than one awesome. office dog. Yeah. Hey, Glad, I saw Glad. Glad, are you out there? All good. Come in real quick. Hey, Squad. Walker. He runs hey, our, I'm Walker. our nice services you. organization. Yeah. Service. Yeah. Okay. Runs our services organiza organization as well as solution architecture and our industry practice. So very, so. you're very involved in onboarding of customers. Like, yeah, that's correct. Onboarding, yeah. changing, transforming. Okay. Explaining this new digital technology. Do you have a like a a close relationship with the integrators that are using Tulip yeah. as well? So part of my team also is the enablement of the integrators. So teaching them how to how to use Tulip, how to transform with Tulip, et cetera. What is the typical um, onboarding process for an integrator look like? That is from first introduction to Tulip to being able to develop minimum viable product to what you would describe as power user. Yeah. What's that period? Well, the period, it, you know, it can be, you know, between one to three months. Okay. And That's a good number. Yeah. And they, uh, so we have a lot of, a lot of stuff is online. We have a lot of online resources. Tulip University, et cetera. They go through, you know, so most of our partners are also resellers. So there's like a, there's a, a it's kind of a sales enablement type portion to it. They, they have to have people in our university getting certified, passing the, the courses. And then there are specific courses around, you know, how you deliver Tulip solutions. Uh, once they get all that, they do one project uh, and we give them a homework exercise. And if we get that all done, then they get certified and they're off and running by themselves. What percentage of people who partake in that endeavor actually get certified? Well, we try to hit 100%. There's okay. a lot of a lot of the bigger integrators. They'll do like 50%, and we need to push them, you know, towards the end. Uh, it has to do with you know if there's a if they have a project and they have a customer, 
then the percentages are much. Right, they have an incentive to. They, they incentive, and that's not unique to Tulip. That's like everybody's uh, problem. Well, here's the money question right here. So if there was one, if there was one thing you could say to all integrators who are considering, not just integrators, integrators, OEMs, end users who are considering using the Tulip platform, the one thing that you would want to communicate to every single person do this or don't do this or do these things, what would that be? You're like technically or? It's the thing that you and your team all bitch about. It's the thing that you would go, God, I'm this again. Yeah. So yeah, first of all, you have to think differently. Right? The, day, the, 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 days, the days of I'm gonna sit there and make this complicated thing so they are relying on me is gone. We're democratized right now, right? Yeah. And you need to kind of you need to you need to uh, get with the you get with the times yeah. and understand that your business model is changing. Yes, right. Okay. And you need to you, you you're, you're still going to make money, but you're going to make your money differently. What if I described it this way? Um, our approach and what we teach the integrators that we work with is the idea that you are going to go deep and stay long with a client. It, those days, your job now is to collaborate with your client, yeah. onboard your client, then teach them what it is right. you do let the client take ownership and your job is to do heavy lifting and focus on the things, yeah. you know, ML, AI, you know, turning data into additional value for the organization, not presenting it on a dashboard, right? Would that be an accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. Okay. And it's, okay. you know, my analogy is, you know, we're in, we're in this as a service type of environment, right? Uh, you know, in, in the 1900s when electricity came around, every plant had an electricity manager. Yeah. Right. There was a guy who was responsible, like a CIO is today, responsible for electricity. Yeah. And, you know, now it's a plug in the wall. And if it doesn't work, you call somebody right. and you fix it. The, you know, we're, we're heading that way. So you need to think, you have to have this as a service mentality. So you're, you know, you're, 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 and you're going to get revenue from subscription. Yes. Which is not what they're used to, right? right. So, and, and if you are... They don't think in terms of ARR and MRR, no, right? That just the, doesn't... What I explained to them is, you know, you're selling a subscription that is recurring. In order to make sure the customer comes again and buys more, you need to offer your services. So yeah, you're not getting paid hourly for those, but you're getting paid hour for that. So you have to kind of make that mental shift to go, I'm actually spending time supporting an AR revenue stream versus a like an hourly. So we have certification like you can resell Tulip, a certification you can resell and implement Tulip by yourself. Okay. So until you're certified to implement Tulip by yourself, we try, we work with them. So we have some kind of arrangement. Uh, and again, this is pretty new. So we are we are we're gonna our target is to get more than ten fully certified this year. Walker, yeah. your your background, just yeah. to, like you know, that actually was my next question was gonna be. It's tell me your background. It's important because yeah. you know we talk about you're building a technology company and you're also building deep industry expertise. Right. And I and I you should hear that perspective. So, so um, in the 1990s, right, I, I did my PhD in Europe. Yeah. And in 1990s there was this European framework, framework research project that is, was the basic, the basis for Industry 4.0. So, you know, Aachen University, all these, and so we did, we called it, we didn't call it Industry 4.0, we didn't call it IOT, we didn't call it, it was, we had different names for it, and that was kind of the basis for what is Industry 4.0. So like IOT devices and all that thing, we, you know, if you, if you read some of those pieces from those days, you know, they actually tell you about that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I... And I, your dissertation was on... What exactly. Uh, manufacturing systems, it's called Holonic Manufacturing Systems, okay. right. which is kind of a, uh, trying to represent social structures in... Ah, dude, I, I, uh, I am pretty sure I read your dissertation. Okay, well, good. <laughs> yeah, I am fairly certain I read your dissertation. My, my back, I have an undergraduate degree in sociology. Okay. So how I ended up here was... The, the, the emergence of I, the convergence of watching manufacturing exodus in the Northeast in the 1980s. Why did that happen? Studying sociology and learning that it wasn't American greed, it wasn't American companies' greed, it was a lack of adoption of Industry 3.0. Japanese and Germans went way ahead and put American companies at a strategic disadvantage in the late 70s and early 80s. They had to chase cheap labor in order to just stay alive. And my focus was, whoa, the fourth industrial revolution, if you look at Moore's law, the fourth industrial revolution is gonna happen somewhere in the early 2000s. So why don't we position American manufacturing to yeah. lead digital, lead that, that in that revolution? That was how I got here. Yeah. That, I and went back and got a double E and, and my master's is actually in education. Wow. As it relates to industry 4.0, <clears throat> I'm very hard on the EU's standard. I'm incredibly hard on it because they have maturity starting with computerization. And it actually doesn't start with computerization, it starts with education. 
education is actually the first block. Yeah. But because that block isn't there, ev everyone thinks, they don't think in terms of kaikaku, right? The break between two transformative revolutions. There's a, a break in groundbreaking innovation, right? So it's same game, completely new rules, right? you have to educate in that jump. Or otherwise, if you don't educate, then all you end up with are Tesla and Amazon and the, the new players. Education of the existing players makes them able to follow suit. That, that's my whole... That's you interesting. Know. Yeah. They, you know, they, 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 so maybe, maybe it's because the Europeans, in terms of education, they're very... It's they're baked very, into the education. It's baked in, exactly. Right. They're very social and group-oriented in how they do education, yeah. which is very different than the U.S., which is much more individualistic. Right, innovative. Yeah, individualist, individualistic innovation. Innovation, yes. exactly. So anyway, so, you know, after that, I, 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 academia is not in my... Like, I, it's, I'm, I need to move faster than You solve academia. problems, right. Yeah, so I went to academia, and I went to industry and worked kind of in the automation MES space for some 20 years. And in 18, this kind of bubbled up, you know, I saw this bubbling up, the whole big data and industry 4.0. I said, hey, you know, this is where I came from. And then I uh, found Nathan by chance, because uh, in like a LinkedIn thing. I'm Israeli as well. Yeah. So, you know, we connected and he convinced me to come over. You know what's really crazy? Total side note. If you, I, I get introduced to lots of new technologies. Everybody reaches out on LinkedIn. Hey, we check our new, is this going to play in the market? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Here are two nations that are absolutely leading in innovation, okay, that mo most people have no idea, okay? Number one is Israel, okay? If you look at new software platforms, it is absolutely stunning yeah. how many of them are originating in Israel, that little tiny country. Okay, Wonder Logics is a perfect example, by the way. And Turkey. So Israel and Turkey. It is absolutely stunning to me the number of innovative platforms that are coming out of Israel and Turkey, right? And the reason why is, is for me, the reason it's stunning is it, it, the populations are not that big, yeah. right? So, you know, when you look at Germany, Germany has an enormous population and they have a great, you know, foundational base. So it makes sense. But when someone, it, it is crazy to me, the number of innovative solutions that are coming out of Israel and yeah. Turkey. And I think it would surprise most people if they were actually to do a deep dive and take a look to see that, that yeah. it, 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 if you were to do a heat map across the globe, Israel and Turkey would be two of the hottest spots. Right. It's really crazy. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's staggering. Uh, one last thing, on how big is your team? So we're in 30. 30, okay. Yeah. And, we, and that's kind of the- Global? The, yeah, okay. uh, global size. Because again, we are, you know, we are relying on partners. It's, it's a traditional channel now, right? It's, it's not, the idea is not to have a big team to support all our customers as well. We rely on channels. And it's also, you know, as, as again, it's different in technology. It's about adoption and guiding. So I, I tell my team, we are, we're not, uh, you know, we're solution, you know, we're solutions, we're solvers, we, you know, we're solvers, etc. But uh, we are much more guides. We're like expert guides. You know, when you want to climb a mountain, you want to get a guide that knows has been there many times. Right. But he's never, he's not going to climb the mountain for you. You need to do it yourself. And so this is one of the questions I'm going to ask you about. It's, it's the. The challenge, I would I say, the biggest challenge is that we have in educating is there's no way to educate people on all the technological pitfalls. Why it is you need to make this architectural decision over this architectural decision because this one will create this one will create technical debt and this one won't because based on your your technology curve, your ROI curve, you, you're you're going to continue to want to you're going to want to you'll be able to build on this decision. You won't be able to build on that one. Right, and this could be something as simple as um, why is it that when I, when I have a distributed architecture where I have a server in the middle and I have a distributed architecture, the things out on the edge are the ones that need to instantiate the connection in. Or why it is, you know, rather than having the server instantiate the connection out, the thing out there needs to instantiate the, the connection in. Why? Lots of reasons, but, a whole, but the point is, is it's much easier for all of you to throw a marker at me than it is for me to go to you and ask you for your data and then ask you and then ask you and then ask you. It's much easier for you to just report into me, but also it's more secure. If, if, I, if there's a path for you to talk to me from the edge, but there's no path for me to talk to you from outside, then you instantiate a connection to me, we certify it, and then I respond to it. There's no way to communicate that, those technological challenges to a broad audience, right? It's, there's no way to, to just go to a non-technical audience 
and, and educate that. You can't do it, it's impossible. You understand it, you understand it. Technical people understand it, non-technical people don't. The big challenge with platforms is when I'm gonna make a recommendation, hey, use Tulip, I have to check all those boxes off for the person who's listening to me because I'm never gonna be able to go, yeah, Tulip checks off this box, this box, this box, this box, you know, for architecturally, it checks all these boxes off. And I think vendors need to, the people who handle the messaging need to figure out a way to communicate that in a way, because that's not my expertise, like marketing is not, but they need to figure out how to, to how to communicate the differentiators between our technology and competing technology that on face value do exactly the same thing, right? Um, the, the, what is the future, right? The future is, you know, if you look at the Purdue security model or you look at uh, ISA 95 part one, right? The, the, the mom uh, standard. Why were those standards written? Like, why is it you have a standard for manufacturing execution systems? And why do you have a standard for ERP systems? When all ERP is, is a series of functions grouped together called ERP. And why, and MES is just a series of functions grouped together called MES. Why is that? The future is an, an, an ecosystem where you build functions. You may call that function, you may call that function an MES function, you may call it an ERP function, but the point is it's a function for the business. That's what it is. And that's what you're building. These platforms that we all talk about, that's what we're focusing on. Is this an, a, a platform for solving problems, right? Industrial IIoT platforms are just platforms that have industrial connectivity that are platforms for solving problems, right? Tulip fits that bill, yeah. you know? Um, the biggest challenge for Tulip as you see it. You just mentioned it. It's a transformation. Okay. Explaining it. Okay. You know, people, so people know they have problems. I mean, that you can't take away from them. They know what the, you know, they, hopefully they know what, what's go, what the <laughs> problems in the plant, right? And what they do know is that there exists technology that they know, traditional MESs, et cetera. And they think that is the, you know, so, you know, the, the biggest, you probably experienced yourself. You go to a customer, I need an MES. I said, no, nobody needs an MES. Right. You have a problem you need to solve, yes. right? What and you it? think that is the solution. What is your problem, right? And so it's that tradition, that transformation. So it's essentially, it's the age old transformational thing, right? That, you know, not only, you know, not only do you have to take away from, you know, the, the, the solutions that you know, and you know, it, there's, there's, there's bureaucracy in politics, right? You, 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 if you go to your, you know, and say, we need an MES and everybody knows it's MES, they go, you, nobody can fire you for saying you, Right. You, you need MES. You're never going to get fired for picking uh, GE's, you know, iFix's MES. Not yet. Not yet. You Not won't. yet. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, the other, but, but the other... The other part of it is that people don't understand what this new technology can do for them, right? right. So it's the, the age old, you know, and I have another another one of my analogies that I like... What do you need that I like That I like to tell is, you know, I... I, uh, I listen. I, I go motorcycling a lot. I, I vi So I visited this ghost town in California called Bodhi. Mm -hmm. And the guy who was there was telling me that when electricity came to Bodhi, right, before that, they believed that uh, if you kink a wire, if you take a wire and do a 90, 90 degree on it, the electricity would shoot off the end. Because they didn't know that, they didn't know what it was, right? So think about that analogy in the modern day when we come and say, you know, things like unified namespaces and edge devices and AI and ML, etc. They're names, right? Like electricity, they're names, but they really don't understand what it can do for them and how it's going to try. And the other thing they didn't understand is how it basically will transform mining to the point where the ghost town became ghost town because it just became these big mining companies that ran the whole thing, right? So this is the biggest challenge companies like Tulip have, not just Tulip. It's, it's, it's everybody who fits in the Tulip space, the industrial internet of things platform. You just said it. The customer says they come to you with a problem. And what they know is basically nothing. And what they want is basically nothing, okay? They come to you with a very specific problem. If you use an industrial Internet of Things platform that you're able to do short time to value, you're able to solve the problem quickly, then what they want is what they know is gonna increase, okay? If you do it at scale, it's not gonna be just for the person whose problem you solved, it's gonna be for the whole business. So the whole business is gonna get smarter at the same time. I mean, you know what happens? What they want changes. Mm -hmm. what, what they want is always a function of what they know. The biggest challenge you have is, do they really know what their problem is? Mm 
Because if you solve that problem and they're wrong, then they didn't get any smarter. So what we try to do is we try to solve that problem, but we also try to identify what their real problem is. Some other problem they're not aware of based on our expertise. And then what we try to do is solve both problems in the same solution. So then what you do is you show them the art of the possible. So they think of it, they're still thinking, you talk about the mindset, which is definitely the answer, right? The mindset has to shift. They think of solving problems as projects, standalone turnkey, a request for proposal, functional spe specification, but they never think of it as one, one piece of a much larger puzzle that all has to work together. Which and the, is why you need a platform approach to these issues. No otherwise question. You end up, otherwise you end up with a bunch of silos. Which is where- Which is worse than which, where which, started. Which is where everybody is right now. Precisely. The legacy so, manufacturers are there right now. They, when you ask, I'm gonna be giving the keynote at Mass MEP tomorrow. Slide number three is, why is Tesla and Amazon awesome? Why are Tesla and Amazon awesome? That's the question. And then I just shut up. And I wanna see, do people know? You know, Tesla and Amazon are incredibly similar companies, even though they're in two entirely different industries. Number one, data is their primary commodity. And they build digital ecosystem. Everything in, you know, Bezos' famous email from 2002, right? We, you're not gonna um, share data manually anymore. Everything will be through a service. Yep. And then they wrote a specification for what services will look like. You know what that is for a manufacturer? A platform. Yep. You don't have to write the specification, you buy the platform. You just gotta make sure the platform meets the needs of all your problems. By the way, it's also how you build a scalable platform. It's exactly. You know, the same principles apply directly yeah. to how we organize our engineering resources. You know, and like we organize our team such that it like naturally leads to the platform you want to exist, right? You have Conway's law. The structure of the product you build is going to reflect the communication patterns in your org. You're going to shift your org chart, right? You have two teams. There's going to be a seam in the product between those two teams. Okay, so where in the platform we're building do we want there to be seams? Where do we want there to be good integration points? Okay, let's organize our team boundaries around that so the teams are forced to communicate in the same way that our customers will integrate and build on top of us. While, while also keeping a a mechanism for individuals to innovate within that platform and a mechanism for you to observe their innovation and then decide whether or not you want to promote their innovation to scale or do you leave it as standalone and by the way the 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 means of communication across these different teams is an internal api and at tulip all of our internal apis will be public by default why because we're building for the long term you asked earlier are we going to try and get acquired in two years the answer is fuck no the answer is like hell no the answer is like that is complete abject failure on behalf of every single person here what we're building for is a future state where third parties that don't work at tulip can build on top of the public apis we make available in the same way that another product team could within tulip right the idea here is building for a truly extensible platform that leverages an ecosystem that i believe will become the new manufacturing stack you know it's not going to be tulip saves the world it's not going to be ignition or cafe it's like the reality is an there is an open architecture that is the new, that is like the only way to do business. And we have, I think, an important role to play there, but we're building in with, with, with others and their future contributions in mind. And we're building in such a way that they can plug into the work that we're doing and they can bring their own unique competitive advantage and, and, and value proposition into and through the Tulip platform or next to the platform or whatever, right? But the point is it has to be on an open architecture. I have a couple questions for you and then I have a question for both of you, which is, and I don't know if you have time no, here. I already missed my meeting, so I'm uh, good. <laughs> okay. you got, So I'll, I'll let me pivot to the sure. engineering question. So primary, so you lead engineering, yep. right? Your primary goal as a leader of the engineering group as, it, as, it, as it's designed to serve the mission of Tulip, what is your primary goal for your team? To build the organization a team that can scale and actually deliver this product. What is scale in your mind? Scale is number of users, it's number of, and customers, it, but it's also number of people integrating into the platform, right? Manufacturing is incredibly diverse. We see the tools and methods you use to build one product are differ. We have customers in luxury goods and pharmaceuticals and like automotive, right? Like how are you building and one? bug farming. Yeah. I swear <laughs> to goodness. I, I, I was in Paris Monday morning about a month and a half ago and I'm like meeting with like, they're, they're a biotech company. They take soldier fly larva, they grow it on an automated process, then they send it over to a big press, they squish it, spin it real fast, separate it out for like the protein, the lipids, the fertilizer. And then that night, I'm with Rich Monk Group's leadership team and the next day we're on, we're touring Cartier. 
Like both are transforming their operations with Tulip, right? So like the diverse- so How do we build a product that can do both of those? I'm just gonna point back to the last conversation we had, like, right? I need to orient this team towards building a platform, building open, taking the same tools we're building internally and then turning them around and making them available to the customer. And this goes beyond just APIs. This also means letting people write plugins on top of Tulip and build actual UI that integrates and feels seamless with the rest of Tulip because I know that we cannot do it all, right? We cannot do everything that our customers need. We need to enable others to build on top. Let me ask you this, from an engineering and service perspective, mm -hmm. how do you balance the desires of the customer with what you know is best for them? Here's a good, good example. Uh, y uh, Steve Jobs spent $5 billion developing the iPhone, okay, uh, for, in 2008. And he never got board approval. He never went to the board of directors and pitched the iPhone. He, and you know why? Because there was no way for him to calculate what the value of the iPhone was. It was groundbreaking innovation. So how do you, and, and you know, you have the experience, you have the experience, I have the experience. You have, you see, yeah. you know, the v advantage we have is cultural diffusion. We get to see many manufacturers. Yeah. We're not stuck in just our process. Yeah. And so we can see the commonalities and we can see the differentiators, yeah. right? So we can say, we know when a client tells us they want us to do something and we're going, Eesh, man, if I'm, if I'm in charge here, I'm not going that direction. In fact, I think you're burning, you're wasting your money in that area. I think you need to go in this direction. How do you balance? meeting the needs from a service and engineering perspective, meeting the needs of the client, but while also creating an environment that steers them towards what it is they actually need, yeah. right? How do you balance that? This is one of the core difficulties of building enterprise software because you end up with these large customers that pay you many, many, many dollars and they want that sway and influence over, hey, we need this very specific point thing. Right. And sometimes they're saying, okay, you can push it and move it in this direction, figure out how to generalize it. And sometimes, they're using the product wrong. They're right. doing something wrong that doesn't align with the vision of where we want it to go. And that mismatch is coming out into this feature and that's why they want it, right? right. Now, when we went into our product planning process for this fiscal year, uh, Eric spent a bunch of time collecting input from every single person that interacts with customers. What do our customers need? What do you see as the most critical things? And came up with a very clear agreed upon list of everything that our customers said that they needed. And then we went through and said, okay, where are we ignoring? Right, like what makes sense here? What do we totally agree? And this is absolutely the right thing that we need to push on and this is the weakness of the product. And what are the bets we're making? What are the things that maybe aren't even on this list or are low down and we don't care about the customer input on this because we believe in the future and potential of this. Good. So that's rare. Something else I want to- That's really rare in the platform world. That is very rare. Something, uh, some, I, yeah, I just yeah. spoke with someone yesterday, a, you know, a, a vendor yesterday, and I was making a recommendation on an improvement to their platform, which I know unequivocally is an innovation they, they must have, okay? We, I, not just me, our whole community, and anybody that's on this side of the digital transfer, you know, on the curb, they're on this side towards Industry 4.0, knows they must do this thing. And the response from the product owner was, the product manager was, well, the bet that's being placed in the European Union right now is this other technology. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the technology that the EU is using, or at least he's arguing is using, isn't, isn't gonna scale, and they're gonna have to pivot at some point. Ba basic math, you can calculate it on a whiteboard. But they place their whole bet on the direction the EU is going. When I was thinking in my head, no, there needs to be, you need to be hedging that bet, right? You need to be able to serve the direction they're going, but lay the foundation for where they're as they learn, things th they don't even know they want. Right, they, they don't, don't even know they want. They, you know, Ford, right? Yes. Can't build a you faster have, horse. Yeah, build yeah. A faster horse, right? What about you? How do you balance? So, so we're because so you're at. They're asking you for the solution. Yeah, exactly. So it's back. It's back to what I said before. I need to let me ask. Well, what is your problem? What's what's what is what serves us is this bottoms up uh, way that we do things in tool and digital technology generally that you don't have to solve the whole problem in its entirety before you can show value. Right. So we say, okay, you know, we get it, but let's just focus on what the, we have a, as part of our services methodology, we, you know, we go there, like we start by saying like, let's really go into details about what is your problem. And we also are looking for actual metrics. So if this is your problem, you know, how can we measure that we do improvement and we do small iterations. We'll do a, a, a quick few apps 
and we're talking weeks, right? Yep. Two weeks and show value and make it say, oh, okay, you did affect my, my metric to something that's, that was not. I say that it is not easy because you go to these organizations, you know, and you know, you, you will talk to the production supervisor, he certainly knows what his problem is. But yeah. <laughs> IT comes in and just constantly says, like, oh, I need an MES, I need an MES, this is not an MES, and you have that. So it's, you know, it's not that clean, but that really is what we tend to do. Uh, you know, just kind of start small and build, build value fast. And so, yeah, you want to walk us sure. through Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so this use case is um, kind of tailored for our life sciences customers, right? And in the life science vertical especially, all these guys want to do is make sure that their process is being done right and that they're keeping all of the data that they need to be keeping, right? Because disproportionately, especially versus the general manufacturing and assembly guys, they need to be keeping pages upon pages of batch data and lot numbers and timestamps on every single vial here to make sure that everything's being done right, because if it's being done wrong, that's being injected into a real person. Right? So with this hood, a um, company came to us, said, hey, we think you would be a great partner for us to make this thing. All we need to do is make sure someone's doing it right and make sure that we're actually logging information more than 12 hours after the fact. So with this small little app, I can start existing studies or you know, start new studies. If I click resume study, we do have all of this you know, SOC 2 compliant uh, signing and badge IDing that the regulatory customers need. Yeah. Um, but here's the actual meat of the app, right? So there's a PLC running in the back of this thing that's controlling our lights. It's also watching these two reflectors, but this means that as I'm inf uh, inspecting this unit, I can put my hand in and Tulip starts counting, right? Based on regulatory requirements, I have to be having this thing in front of each colored background for at least five seconds. So I'm not allowed to go forward and say this is good until I do both of those things. You can see also in Tulip, I'm controlling the lights here to inform my operator better. Now the second half of that, right, recording these defects in a fast and easy way, I can say, okay, no, this guy was a defect. I have an entire table-driven solution here to say, oh, what kind of defect am I finding? I think the glass uh, was damaged and I think there was a scratch. Cool, report submitted with full history and batch inspection, all of this kind of back-end work immediately sending to my tulip table or you know, a database somewhere else. Right, so that's done. That's the entirety of that process that required another whole person at the end of the day eliminated. So super simple cases here, but huge implications for data capture, data security. And then because all this data is within Tulip, I can do things like you know, monitor my users and make sure they're being as efficient or as uh, you know, relevant as possible to the things that I'm inspecting. I can say, hey, of the studies that I did today, this week, this month, uh, where are my defects? What am I you know, tracking, logging, all this kind of information as well? And again, that was just done with, there's a PLC in the back here. Tulip is talking about PLC over Modbus with an edge device. But all of that integration is Tulip side. All they did was send this bench, say, there's a PLC on it, do what you will. And everything else is easy done by myself and my intern um, to make sure that all these numbers are feeding up to Tulip correctly. What is the, com the most common integration with Tulip? So you go to a new client. You guys have five or 600 clients and there's some process, what is, walk me through the connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize, right? What is the most common integration? You're connecting how? By far, uh, barcode scans and uh, label prints. So okay. you're plugging a barcode scanner into either this computer or a Tulip Edge device. Okay. Uh, you do some information about it, and then you can print a custom label based on that. You're not very, it's, so it's, is, it, is it not typical to collect data from existing infrastructure, so that is a PLC? Is that, that's done on a case by case, but not Not typical? from the start. Okay. Because it's so easy to start with a Tulip app, develop one and get it on the floor really quickly, okay. these higher level integrations come really commonly, but they tend to come farther along the path of somebody having a whole transformation like this. So let's say I want to combine, I want to unify the data that I'm collecting in a Tulip app that's barcode, right? I want to unify that with process data that's being collected in the PLC. Right. Typically, I would do that where? You can either do that in Tulip or outside of Tulip. We are agnostic to both. So what's the mechanism for me to consume what's in Tulip right. to join it in some third-party app that is able to talk to my PLC? Right. What's in the cover? same kind of function that I can use here to press a button or to save a piece of data or to do anything, I can also interface with an API or yeah. a database. So REST, SOAP. REST. Uh, RESTful, uh, SQL, um, anything 
kind of standard network MQTT. Yep, MQTT, Modbus. Uh, this is Modbus. Not, you guys aren't Spark, Spark Plug B yet, though. Uh, no. Not natively, but no. we can But you there. can code it. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. you can code it. OK. Yeah. What's right. our edge device? So you could turn a station into a Spark Plug B edge of network device, right. in theory. OK, got it. And okay. if I wanted all of this study information, every single study has all this auditable, you know, I can click on a single study and say, oh, this is all the information that changed. This data lives in Tulip right now. If it lives in, instead, your NetSuite, Oracle, whatever database, it looks exactly the same. Got to it. the app, it doesn't function any differently. If I wanted to look at the raw data, yep. so I just want to see, how do I do that? Presuming it's in Tulip, uh, you can access all of your tables. It functions as a relational database in up, the web. Up top, got yep. it, OK. There's a, is there a built-in query browser? I didn't look to see. Yeah. There is? OK. Maybe we head over here and show you yeah, a little sure. behind the scenes. Right. Perfect. You know, my first take on Tulip was, I'm going to wait and see. Mm -hmm. That was my first. Then after a year, I'm like, ah, wow, they're really, you know, they're going in the right direction. I think they're going to, you know, I, I know that you don't want the Ignition Tulip comparison, but my, what I'm looking, you know, at the end of the day, organizations are looking for platform to solve problems. At, at the end of the day, that's just it. They want a single platform to solve problems, one pane of glass, yeah. right? So they don't want a platform that can only give five or six functions of the business. It, they want the option, again, to the, your point, the high ceiling. If they wanted to be crazy yeah. and run the whole business inside that platform, they want to be able to do that. Now, obviously, that's a terrible idea. You shouldn't do that. But for an SMB, maybe it's not. Right, right. To start, right, you exactly. And then you're using Excel today, right? and you don't have an ERP, and you don't have, like, maybe it's not a bad place to start. Yeah. So I think, I look and I think, oh, now I'm trying to figure out who's the, the you know, the, the, the leader in the market in terms of platform for solving problems is Ignition, right? They have the land expand model. They have a, you know, if you look across, if you were to, if we were to do this for Ignition, and let's say we added another color, and it's the number of installations that are unlicensed, okay? It would make up 90% of what you see on the map. It's also worth pointing out that they can't do this. Yeah, right. It's, right. It's, a, yeah. it's an important the, point. Yeah, but my, there are like fundamental architectural... But there are huge limitations to what Ignition does. Yeah. So Ignition has major scale issues, right? That's, a, you know, what most people don't understand about cloud, the customer, and this is the thing you've got to drill in their head, is you won't get scale without being in the cloud. Right. There's no, yeah. you're not going to create, you're not going to create that infrastructure. You will not get scale without going to the cloud because you, what you need is servers distributed all across the world Precisely. and you need load balancing for your client. Like, like, and they don't understand any of that technology, right? You, but you have to go to cloud to, to scale. But That's I, the other thing we should add on there is where are we deployed? Where are our servers deployed oh, yeah. around the world? All the dots of places that, that yeah, we that have would be, computers and servers. Yeah, that would be, and what would be really cool is if you then drew a line yeah, how so they, all so they, could, view, yeah, yeah, they yeah. could view how load balancing was happening. That would be really, really cool. But now when I look at Tulip now, I look and you know, see it more. I had a chance to look at Stanley Black & Decker's solution. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to talk to Jane Arnold at length. You know, she and I sat on the same um, uh, panel together, and I got to talk to her about an hour afterwards about what that journey was like for her before she moved on. But you know, I look at Tulip now, and I think the only problem Tulip has for scale is a messaging problem. You know, it's not. The, and you guys are obviously working on that, yeah, but yeah. it's the issue it's is not the market. The, right. The, it's it's category building. Right. right. It's it's what is Tulip, and how will I use it, and what won't I use it for? Right. Right. So there's I mean there's when people think about Tulip, right? They will latch onto the concepts that they're familiar with. Dashboards. Right? So it's like ah, the dashboard thing, the yeah. construction thing, it's yeah. the, the MES thing, but as you know, just as Mason was saying, there's it's a different category of software that is a different set of capabilities. And so frequently people come here and they see, you know, the demonstrations we have set up and how they're integrated and like that there's there's some kind of aha moment for them of I didn't I didn't I didn't realize that I could do this. Or right. I didn't think about that problem with this tool that is a change. Like I'm curious what your what your perspective is having seen this now. Well, it's also why this, this space exists, right? Because they might have been looking at it like this saying, hey, this is the problem I want to solve. But we have to like open their eyes and say, wait a minute, I have that problem too. And I have that problem too. And, I have, and all of this is being solved on the same platform and why that is so foundational. I'm looking at maturity scale. 
So in the way I look, the way I think, is what I put on your whiteboard. So I look at, I think the biggest mistake most architects make when it comes to digital transformation is they go into digital transformation thinking of it as a, part, a project or something, where it's not, it's a strategy for running the business. And what a customer wants is a function of what they know, and what they know increases based on what you build them, right? So what I look at is, is more the maturity. So what's happening is I think Tulip's probably entering in two primary markets. The place where there's no human interface with the ecosystem at all, and Tulip's becoming that entry point. Last mile. Right, that last mile piece, right? That, that, that piece right there is clear. And then the other piece is I need something uh, web-based, cloud-based, uh, scalably deployed where I can build apps and deploy them to the edge that turn our data into something valuable, right? So you have that last mile piece and then you have the analytics piece. I think that's probably where your big, your big market is, right? The b big opportunity for Tulip is organizations that are the, 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 the one that's doing the last mile, they're not very digitally mature, right? They're early in their maturity. The one who's using it for analytics is more mature than, than the, the first group, but they're not completely mature because you can't be mature if you don't have you know, de scalable, deployable analytics to the edge, right? The place where Tulip's biggest opportunity is, is short, I talk about this all the time, short time to value is like the most important concept in digital transformation. One year at Tesla is five years at any other organization because they're so digitally mature. They're providing values every two to four weeks, every, uh, solutions every two to four weeks. If you look at you at Tesla, is you're literally releasing, you're doing releases every two to four weeks, not every six to 10 weeks. Two. Yeah, right, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, they're, they're literally- By the way, we do releases every two weeks, just to be clear. Right, yeah, yeah, but, but, <laughs> right. My, but my point is that if I go to Ignit Inductive Automation, yeah. they're not, they're doing it every 12 weeks. But a big part of that yeah. is the architecture. And when yeah. I say like they can't yeah. do this, like it's not like they don't have a, like a fancy four the, screens on a wall, that's not the point. The point is like, the architecture that we have allows us to commit. Move fast, get this visibility, scale. Faster than everyone else. But what you want is, what I think you guys want in the market is, you want to take Tulip and plug it into a mature ecosystem, not an immature ecosystem. You want to take Tulip and you want to bolt it onto the side of a mature ecosystem. And the reason why is because the time to value in app development is much lower in Tulip than it is in their ecosystem. That's, the, that's my point. My point is, is that right now, Tulip is very, very much viewed as a, we're gonna go ahead and collect stuff from the operators, functions from the operators. But there's a, there's a whole market for Tulip that I don't, see, that I haven't just heard, I haven't heard you guys talk about, and that is there are companies with very mature digital ecosystems, right? But they're missing, what's their biggest challenge? CICD, right? It's the, how, how do I enable people to do stuff with that ecosystem? That a lot of these organizations that started early, they don't have that piece in place. Power Apps doesn't do it. Yeah. Power BI doesn't do it, yeah. okay? It, 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 that's what they, they thought it would do it, yeah. but it doesn't, right? Tulip is the, the bolt-on. And that's why I keep asking you about the connectors. Okay, so what, what connectors do you actually have? And if, let's say I already have a mature digital ecosystem and I go ahead, all right, we're gonna go ahead and license Tulip. We're gonna put three stations out on the plant floor. We're gonna plug into an existing ecosystem and we're going to go ahead and build an app in two hours, okay, what does that look like? What, 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 what use case could I select, right? I, I know I can do SQL, Postgres, REST. I know I can do MQTT ingestion, but not Spark Plug B, right? I can consume from MQTT broker, but not Spark Plug B. So I would just eliminate that, any Spark Plug B option. I don't know all the other ones. You know, what else could I, you know, OPC UA, right? OPC. So it, I think it's that. I think if you were to communicate that better, the connection piece, mm -hmm. not just the low code, no code, which you guys are doing a really good job of communicating that. It's the, you know, this is a platform for solving problems no matter how mature you are, mm -hmm. right? Maybe, maybe you've already picked a platform. I'm, we're a ThingWorks house. So is it ThingWorks or Tulip? No, it isn't, yeah. you know? And, and I, I think that's what needs to be communicated. All right, guys, I just finished a day-long tour at Tulip here in Somerville, Massachusetts in the old Ford assembly plant for the Ford Edsel. Spent a couple hours together going over Tulip, incredible platform, going over strategic partnerships, just talking, breaking bread, 
all afternoon and morning long. Um, we have almost two terabytes of videos here at our trip to Massachusetts. Tomorrow we've got the, uh, the keynote address at MassMEP. Let me say this when it comes to Tulip. In terms of low code and no code, Tulip is an absolutely incredible platform. And when you take Tulip and you couple it with HiByte, what you have is a no code platform that plugs directly into an existing digital infrastructure. It is absolutely profound, all right? Uh, we have a bunch of videos that are for members only, uh, for the YouTube members. If you want to join as a YouTube member, click on the link down below. We'll see you in the next one.